welcome, Mike. I was on the Summer of Solidarity tour, and it was, it was kind of a traumatic experience. All these union guys kidnapped me, and they forced me in an RV, and they made me drink beer, and, and here I've seen Would stories, you? which I, I think is one of the bigger challenges of the labor movement. Uh, but on a serious note, um, this was a tour of folks that were uh, sort of more on the grassroots side of things, uh, rank and file workers trying to interact with other rank and file workers. Uh, Ann Feeney and Michael O'Brien came along and did a number of concerts. Uh, and a session where uh, a lot of different people that normally don't get to interact came together to interact, share stories, talk about common experiences, uh, exchange ideas, which all too often there's very little of in the labor movement. Uh, typically you have uh, union organizers writing uh, solutions to labor problems that sound like prescriptions as opposed to actually coming in and, and working with folks and organizing something. Uh, so this was sort of what this tour was about. Uh, we started off, uh, they started off in Philly, I wasn't with them. Uh, in Pittsburgh, I visited steel workers locked out in the chemical, I believe Ann, uh, mooned some workers, some scabs. Uh, Did Ann do that? <laughs> Moon security, security guards. Security guards. <laughs> security guards. The goon squads. Um, and so there was a concert there. We went over to Detroit, uh, where there were workers engaged in uh, fighting for pensions, the Detroit bankruptcy. Spent time in Chicago, some striking Rotec workers. There were different actions at the various stops um, related to foreclosures, uh, something that the labor movement is getting more involved in, that there seems to be a lot of appetite for help on. And something which, if you look at the tradition of the labor movement in the 1930s, the unemployed councils played a very large role in getting people involved by fighting evictions. Um, so there was a lot of those in both Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, Detroit, those kind of actions. Uh, we visited with striking Rotec workers outside Rotec's North American headquarters in Chicago. Uh, went to Madison, where currently people are being arrested. We're seeing in the state capitol groups of larger than 20. <coughs> Only one person was arrested the day we were there. Uh, we went to the Minnesota State Fair, which was very surreal. Uh, I had to eat bacon on a stick multiple times. I got drunk and made a large donation to Minnesota Public Radio. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a fun time. Um, we went up to Moorhead, uh, to Fargo, uh, where there was a, another concert and met with a number of workers who had been locked out for 22 months of Crystal Sugar, uh, the BCTGM. Uh, and then we went over to Missoula, where we went to a picket line, some healthcare workers, there was another concert. And then to Portland, uh, where, I'm getting my days confused, we did, whoa, oh, we invaded Portland State University and we visited some workers involved in the Longshore lockout there. So over the course of the trip, we got to interact with a lot of different folks in a lot of different places. There are a lot of interesting <coughs> stories. Oh, and, and we went to Butte, Montana, where we visited the grave of Frank Little, Yay. which was uh, kind of remarkable because his grave says something like, uh, wait, hold up. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting on Instagram. Uh, Slain by capitalist interest for organizing and inspiring his fellow men. That's on his tombstone. That's right. Well, that's uh, one hell of a tombstone. Uh, and then, you know, we were in Portland and been down in San Francisco, went out to a fast food workers strike yesterday. It didn't actually appear that there's any workers who worked in fast food there, but that's a whole other story. Uh, and then some folks went out to the airport today where food workers there are actually on strike. And um, there's something else. I, I slept in today. I was exhausted. I'll tell you. Yes. Yes, out to the waste management uh, where there's a tough contract struggle there. So the trip's been interesting. Um, a lot of folks in a lot of different places, a lot of interesting stories of things happening to people, hearing a lot of complaints about union bureaucracies and leadership, that's not surprising. <coughs> it's been good to get out and visit some workers that were through some tough struggles. We're going to have a story coming out about the fallout of the crystal sugar lockout, and what that meant to folks there. Um, and so I think just a, a lot of very interesting ideas about things that are going on. And it was, it was good. Uh, I spent nearly <coughs> 30 years on the national staff of the communication workers as an organizer and international rep uh, in New England primarily, but also working throughout the Northeast. And uh, while I was a full-time union rep, I also did a lot of uh, freelance uh, labor journalism work. And since my redeployment from the union five years ago, I've 
uh, plowed that field full time, um, producing uh, three labor related books and uh, some articles and blog postings. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, impressions of the state of labor journalism today, and then we should open it up because we have some folks who've been in the thick of trying to get labor's message across more effectively in key Bay Area labor struggles, like the BART strike. Uh, Brother Chris Finn has been uh, a man of all media, along with his uh, fellow strikers, and uh, I think that's one of the most interesting case studies we could get into of how does labor best shape its message in the middle of a difficult contract strike and try to develop uh, support within the community where uh, certainly public transportation in the community, if a strike is effective, is uh, disrupted, at least temporarily. Um, I don't think we need to belabor the obvious, which is that uh, mainstream media coverage of labor gets uh, progressively worse. There's not much left of the labor beat, as it's called, on daily newspapers around the country. Uh, with a few notable exceptions, coverage of labor news is buried in the business news section of the paper. You have people who are more generalists in the business news, news field as opposed to specialists in anything really related to labor. And the quality and quantity of the coverage uh, reflects that. Uh, the official labor press is another that we won't beat to death here. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, it is uh, pretty sorry and, and shrinking, uh, at least in its hard copy form. A lot of unions, for budgetary reasons, have cut back uh, both you know, on local union newspapers, shop newsletters, and certainly national union publications. Steel labor, I think, is probably one exception. So a very presented, well-packaged, high-quality publication. There's a few other uh, fairly lively official labor press exceptions, but I can I would say generally, you know, union papers, which always suffered from the Pravda syndrome, being kind of a house organ, uh, not really covering what was going on uh, so much as trying to be a kind of family album for the official um, you know, that, that uh, area of the labor press, labor journalism is, is, is kind of shrinking for better or worse, depending on your point of view. Uh, the good news is, since we should always be looking for the upside and the optimistic uh, aspect of things is that thanks to the internet and the blogosphere, there's really been an explosion of labor coverage in the new uh, online outlets uh, that uh, long standing publications like Labor Notes have started. Uh, in these times, the monthly magazine in Chicago now has a labor blog working in these times that has actually raised enough money periodically to employ illustrious colleagues like. Uh, uh, Brother Elk here and uh, others. Uh, Alternet now has a, a labor blog. Uh, Salon runs a lot more labor coverage. Uh, Lee's publication, The Nation, has greatly expanded its, uh, its labor reporting. Um, and there's a whole crop of younger male and female labor writers doing a really good job of covering uh, some cutting edge labor organizing activity involving Walmart workers and fast food workers and immigrants of all kinds. So there's a lot going on out there, but you're not going to find it for the most part in the daily press, in the traditional media, in official union publications. You're going to have to look for it online or in a few places like Labor Notes, where uh, an alternative labor hard copy publication, at least once a month in the case of Labor Notes, tries to uh, present commentaries and analyses and reports and first person accounts of critical organizing, strike and bargaining, uh, and union democracy and reform struggles around the country. So I think that's a very positive development, and uh, uh, it's one that can help fan the flames of a much needed uh, rank and file upsurge in and around the labor movement. And I would invite everybody to support any of the aforementioned uh, new outlets for labor writing. Uh, because if labor writers don't have labor readers, just as if radio talk show hosts don't have listeners, uh, that's a pretty serious disconnect. So yeah. we need to support these institutions. It's problematic when one reads it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me stop there. And you know, I think maybe we, it would be great to start with uh, some of the folks who've been on the bus, who've been through some of these steelworker struggles that the Solidarity Tour highlighted, some of their impressions and experiences good, bad, or indifferent to dealing with the press, and certainly locally, you know, Chris, if you want to speak to the challenge of uh, uh, 
of uh, the BART workers uh, getting their message across. And during that six day going on period, I think the goal of the governor is basically to make the strike uncomfortable for us. Uh, Mark Desalnier is talking about legislation or proposing legislation to take away the right to strike. I think the strategy all along has, on um, BART's part, BART has more money than they've ever had in their history. There's absolutely no reason to try to come after the workers for concessions. Uh, we gave up $100 million in concessions last time. And uh, since then, ridership has just skyrocketed. The revenues have skyrocketed. Uh, but they've decided now is a good year to try to break the union and establish that relationship for, for the future ongoing. Uh, they hired a new general manager. They brought her in with basically a two-year contract that expires, what's today, the 30th, tomorrow? <laughs> Doesn't expire tomorrow, but she's fully vested with a uh, lifetime medical for the rest of her life if she's still working at Bart as of tomorrow. Uh, so basically it means come in here, negotiate with the union, bust them, put them out on strike, you take the heat, you can move on to somewhere else and uh, add that to your resume. Uh, she brought in Thomas Hawk, who's the vice president of labor relations of Veolia Transport, Transdev now it's being called. Uh, they are the biggest private manager of public transportation in the country. I uh, just came back from ATU's convention, international convention. And Violi is one of the biggest companies, international, multinational firms going around privatizing public transportation in the country. Um, so they brought in their vice president to basically put us out on strike. And then once we're out on strike, they figured we'd get knees weak and come crawling back and say, okay, we're willing to accept any kind of cutbacks you propose. Just don't make us stand out on strike anymore. Uh, that plan backfired on them. I remember it stood strong. It was uh, only four days before the, that was July 4th. It was probably the most non-strategic week to go out on strike. <laughs> um, you know, the slowest ridership week. It's a, big, a holiday week. Uh, but we were in partnership with SEIU who wanted to go out on strike at that point. Um, so it's, it's, if we stick to meet, I guess, is the topic. Uh, it's definitely front page news that BART's getting into negotiations before they even start. Uh, people want to know where the train's going to be running or aren't they going to be running. Uh, it's hard to get the message of what the issues are. BART has, a, I think, a seven-person media team. On top of that, they brought in Sam Singer, who's notorious for slinging mud at folks and tearing down people's reputations, uh, $15,000 a month. Um, and so they were putting out all kinds of false stories about us that are very sensationalistic. Uh, $134,000 a year the average worker makes. Uh, if you look at some, yeah, you know, nice watch on my wrist and, you know, a lot of bling here. You know. And the general manager's $320,000 salary, or last year's general manager who made $330,000 after being fired. Um, so there's a lot of sensationalistic information. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting facts as well. Uh, the media hasn't kind of caught on to too many of those. They are, they're interested in that Thomas Hawk got $400,000. They're interested in Thomas Hawk. Uh, went out on vacation uh, when we're nearing our deadline to reach a contract. So, you know, they, they put a couple of smidgens in there. They never once mentioned that uh, BART had a surplus, $125 million surplus this year. Uh, so that was not making the media at all. Um, I've mentioned that probably in every single time I talk to the press. And uh, I'll have 10, 12 cameras come up to me and microphones and and I'll talk at length for 15 minutes, and I'll mention that in there, all the concessions we gave, and most of it doesn't get in there. Um, they look for the little wisecracks or something like that that indicates whether or not trains are going to be running. Um, as far as getting our message out there, I think that some reporters, uh, they face the same cutbacks everybody else has, so they're overworked and underpaid. So I think the more that we can present facts to them, it seems that they were less harsh this year in their attacks than they were in our last contract negotiation talks. Some of that may have been due to the fact that um, they do understand that we gave up four years of zero raises, $100 million in concessions, um, BART's loaded with money that everybody knows their ridership is way up. Um, and the more that it seems, the more that just the typical things, if you can prepare some information and give it to them, they have some facts to go off of. That wasn't done so much last time. We've tried to provide them some more information. Some of them are, are actually interested in facts, with the, you know, whether or not they choose to tell them is a different story. Um, 
We, at this point, we're trying to get more of the members of the public to help further the story. So when we had the August 1st rally, uh, it wasn't about inviting politicians so much. It was about inviting different members of the community, different community struggles, and uh, spreading our word that way. Um, and I think at this point, when we went out on strike, we had massive public support uh, of the people that we interacted with, it was high 90% of the people that supported us. You get a few fingers here and there, but it's almost laughable. It's you know that one irate guy kind of thing. Um, when we came back from strike, we were getting the same positive comments in the stations. People were coming up to the station agents expressing support. But with the media, with the politicians also um, talking about whether or not we should have the right to strike, uh, there, it seems to be, there's a lot of feedback out that there's a lot of negative, strong negative sentiment out there, and that's what's being expressed. So our job is, if we think about why do we care uh, what's in the media, it means it's kind of based on what message is getting to the public, and what's the public going to do with that message. And I kind of see it as, what's in the media, our members say, oh no, the public hates us if uh, there's a negative message in the media about us, which isn't necessarily true. Um, so it determines, it affects our members' morale, and it might affect uh, decisions that politicians make about which direction to go as far as attacking us or backing off on the attacks. And so I think what we're trying to do is bypass the media to a certain extent, and I would like to hold more town hall meetings where we reach people that maybe they need to hear a little bit more facts. A lot of people express that they want to support us, but they don't know the facts. So if we're to hold more direct town hall meetings, kind of lay out the story, what's going on, and get them to express that support, either written or emails or phone calls, that kind of stuff, it might bypass a lot of the reluctance on the part of the media to get our message out there. So uh, I think some of getting our message out there does also come down to, are you as a union organized to come up with a message that you can present to the media? And then it's up to the media whether or not to, ex to accept it and carry it forward. Uh, so some of that I think is, you know, do leaderships of unions have that strategy? Do the memberships have that strategy? Uh, so there's, you know, some internal questions there as well, I believe. So other than that, you know, other things that affect the media are polls when they hire somebody like Sam Singer to go out and ask questions and, and say, uh, they pose questions in such a way that you can't give a positive answer towards the worker situation. Um, you know, would you rather have a train that falls off the tracks because it hasn't had uh, money put into safety, or would you rather give workers a you know raise when they already make one hundred thirty-four thousand dollars or something uh, outrageous, which isn't true? Um, so, uh, what else can I add? Current and uh, it's tricky moderating coming up with the flyer that the the members who are active are willing to hand out. Uh, because the members obviously feel a strong sense of outrage at all the lies are being told about them. So they want to lash out at management to a certain extent. And that's, the public isn't necessarily in that position. So to come up with a message that's going to be um, digestible, I guess, by the public that still <laughs> resonates with the members. Uh, but but uh, we did come up with some flyers and, and members did go out and get a very positive reception. Uh, we do plan to do that more. As far as town hall meetings, it might just be organizing uh, if a member is in a church or something like that. So it's not so much just an open town hall invitation, but kind of targeted community groups where we might expect some questions or even a sense of support. And then 134,000. So the average the the average pay uh, in our union is actually fifty-six thousand uh, dollars wages. Uh, but Bart was hiring Sam Singer. Uh, he was paying people. $20, I don't know what it was, but to hand out postcards, they handed out thousands of these postcards that said we made $134,000. Uh, and the best we can figure out, and they've said we made a bunch of different numbers, so I don't know, if, you know, they're saying we make on 30, 30, 1,000, all these different numbers have been out there. Um, they put in benefits they, is what I find. That's one of the things yeah. they do. They, they put in, uh, when we pay into certain things, they also add that in, um, some of the monies that we pay. Uh, they add in, like I said, the average salaries of everybody who works at BART, which is all upper management. Right. So when they that make, you know, three hundred thousand dollars, that gets averaged as the average worker at BART, the average employee at BART. Um, so, and then they had a hiring freeze for Rose. They drive up, they force overtime, essentially. So they drive up overtime, and then they figure the overtime and say, look how much money they make. Well, so, you know, those people are working at three o'clock in the morning, 
um, you know, the day becomes a week, so in the day after their shift is over, coming in four hours early before their shift's supposed to start, their day's off, because BART hasn't hired enough people. And then they turn around and attack our workers for doing that extra work. Yeah, uh, Somebody did an independent study of the data, because uh, the data are publicly available. San Jose Mercury News has posted a bunch of public salaries. And uh, somebody, I guess, scraped the data and did their own analysis and came up, I think, with a $56,000 number. Um, and so some people did use that number for a little bit. But other than that, um, they haven't, I haven't seen any corrections. My, my name is Patrick Young. I, I work for the steel workers in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh. I'm on, the, I'm on the national staff of the campaigns department. Uh, I've known Mike for a while because he's covered uh, strikes and, and other labor disputes that we've been part of. And, and the, the, the whole idea of this, this tour, this project, was, um, you know, we, we actually joke about, about exactly how we came up with the idea to, to do the tour, but we, we wanted to travel across the country and visit different types of uh, uh, struggles that, that, uh, that, that are going on and support uh, local organizing and connect the grassroots. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, I, I spend a lot of time working on strikes in, in smaller towns like uh, Paducah, Kentucky, uh, or Metropolis, Illinois, where I met Stephen Lacker, in Sudbury, Ontario, where we met Mike O'Brien. Uh, both of them are on, uh, on the tour. And uh, a, a lot of times our members, uh, all of us, feel really isolated in these smaller towns. Even in, even in communities like, like uh, Pittsburgh, we feel relatively isolated. Um, seems like we're the only ones that are doing this type of stuff. So we wanted to travel around the country and see what else is going on, uh, learn what we could about major trends in terms of organizing, because uh, I, I definitely have, have the feeling that there is a, a major uptick in economic justice organizing going on. Uh, and, and, and probably it, it's, to me, it's more, more exciting than anything that I've seen in my lifetime um, you know, there definitely have been more compelling and, and uh, exciting political moments. You know, I got politicized during the, the global justice movement. Uh, definitely, the, the Occupy movement was was very exciting. But but really, what we're seeing right now is is serious organizing, where it's grassroots, it's building strong structures, it's building local uh, uh, local communities, local resistance projects, and uh, folks are doing really exciting things. We're seeing, and, and, and we saw three major trends in terms of what we, uh, what we were dealing with when we were traveling the country. The first is uh, anti-austerity organizing. Um, fight, fights against budget cuts, like like our brothers and sisters from uh, from BART. We also had similar uh, similar situations in uh, uh, Wisconsin uh, with uh, the the Walker regime uh, in Chicago with the Emanuel regime uh, and the and the really really incredible strike that the uh, CTU CTU ran. And then over in Philadelphia, uh, with uh, there's a, there's a coalition of of teachers. Uh, parents and students called Philadelphia Coalition Advocating for Public Schools, and you know they're kind of doing a lot of what you're talking about, breaking down this rift between the folks who are relying on public ser public services and the people who are providing those public services, and and, and trying to create a common uh, uh, a, a common narrative around that. A similar project going on in, in Pittsburgh with uh, with uh, the ATU Local 85 and their their riders union, uh, Pittsburghers for Public Transit. The second major trend we're seeing is, uh, uh, is anti-foreclosure and, and, and housing activism. And that's something that, that I didn't really notice uh, was as, as large or expansive uh, as it was. And, but it was really, a, uh, there's really amazing organizing going on in uh, Detroit, Chicago, and Minneapolis. And we had an opportunity to engage in some really kick-ass actions with the Detroit Eviction Defense. Uh, the Chicago anti foreclosure, uh, the Chicago anti eviction campaign, and Occupy Our Homes in uh, in Minneapolis, where they're they're move, they're stopping evictions, uh, they're moving people back into into their houses, they're mobilizing for, for court dates, they're doing really incredible stuff, and they're having and, and they're and they're being able to, to bring enough uh, pressure to bear on a lot of these banks that their their direct action casework is keeping people in their houses. So that's very very exciting to see. Uh, and then the, the third thing we're seeing that, that I'm, I'm very excited about is new new forms of of uh, worker organizing. Uh, you know.
there's a lot of there's a lot of projects and groups out there that are changing the definition of uh, of what it means to to organize as a worker. We're moving, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of even mainstream unions moving away from the the trend towards organizing workplaces and starting to think about organizing workers. And that's, and that's what we're seeing with the fast food strike action that happened yesterday, 50 cities uh, around the country. And, and um, I saw 50 or 60 fast food workers there, Mike. I, I, were they? Yeah, there, there were a bunch of them. Four or five of the folks who spoke were, were fast food workers. They, they weren't from that McDonald's. They, were, they weren't from that McDonald's. There, were, there was a number of folks that were like laid off, it seemed. There were, there, they were laid there off was, and fired from somewhere else. That was that one group of, of folks who were kind of towards the le towards the left of the stage, but we marched past like six or seven fast food restaurants. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely not seeing uh, wall wall organizing happening uh, in those in those workplaces, and you know, it's uh, it, it's an interesting organizing organizing model because there's there's definitely a lot of fast food places where there's two or three people that are part of the project. Um, and what kind of power do you have with two or three people in one fast food restaurant? Not a whole lot, but two or three people in a whole bunch of fast food restaurants. That's a little more interesting, but still, I, I, I'm personally skeptical about the long-term viability of a project like that um, un, you know, until, until they're building density in grassroots activism inside those, uh, inside those particular workplaces. So I definitely echo what, uh, you, know, what yeah, you mentioned should, there. We should get into that at some point. That's an interesting topic. Um, I, I mean, that's, I think it's I think it's a huge topic, but it's simply, you know, it was very similar with all our Walmart. You know, they're they're calling what you know what they're calling strikes, and and in in a lot of the strikes uh, on Black Friday, you had four or five people it was a big strike. Uh, no. uh, you know, pulling out with uh, uh, um, missing a day of work with you know three or four hundred community supporters. So, uh, to what extent is this is this worker driven, and to what extent is this driven by uh, outside organizing, that's unclear. And to what extent are workers in these industries going to be able to take the lead in organizing their workplaces is going to be the, the, the question that you know, makes, it, uh, makes this project rise or fall. Um, in, in Pittsburgh, we have a project called Fight Back Pittsburgh, which is, which is through the Steelworkers Associate Member Program, and it's a local union that anybody can join. And we have committees that in, in various workplaces, and they're doing kind of internal organizing. Uh, we're not planning on going to board elections with any of those committees. Uh, what we're doing, we're going to launch this in, in mid-September with, with one grocery store in town, is they're setting up a grievance procedure, and they're just going to start filing grievances with their boss. They don't have a contract, they're grieving. They're grieving the fact they're pissed off about the fact that nobody gets breaks. Um, who knows how that works? Maybe we'll get them all fired. Uh, maybe it will create a new model. We, you know, we, we're, uh, we're trying new things. We're definitely seeing new things uh, happen. To the point of the, of the panel here, which is about you know, uh, labor journalism, uh, I, you know, I think that, that the uptick of social media um, and kind of social media blogs, online sources, and really uh, democratizing uh, the, the, the media structure has been incredibly huge for our movement because now we're having unions and workers uh, and, and community organizations have an opportunity to start telling their own stories and we're having uh, citizen journalists um, uh, and, you know, be able to, to tell, the, tell the stories of what they're seeing around and we're also seeing you know, folks like uh, Mike and Steve be able to do reporting and have it shared and posted again and again and again for those of us who don't get paper copies of labor notes or in these times. Um, I, I get one of the two and I'm not telling you which one. <laughs> um, so, so, so definitely, uh, you know, and, and one thing that it, just, just one more, one last thing on, on the labor journalism, and I'll, I'll shut up, and we can maybe have have more of a conversation. Is that, uh, you know, I, I think that you know, as somebody who works on campaigns uh, in, in the labor movement as as my job, uh, I, I think that we do a pretty terrible job of telling our story. Uh, we tell facts, uh, and and our guy, and our folks get pissed off about this. You know, the management said this, but we said this, and it's you know. Even our even our communications folks want to play a ping pong game. You know, it's uh, well, no, the actual fact is this. Well, 
I don't know. I don't think, maybe it's because I have, have ADD and I can't remember things for very long, <laughs> but I don't think that facts change people, people's minds. I think that stories change people's minds. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of research that, that backs that up. That's, uh, that's, that's not too far out there. And, uh, and, and, and we do, do a lot of telling facts. We don't do a lot of telling stories. One of the reasons I think the fast food actions are getting a lot of hype is they're telling a pretty good story. Uh, they're, putting, uh, they're putting sympathetic folks out there uh, as their spokespeople. They're creating a bigger narrative that's really easy for the media to latch on to. In a lot of our campaigns, we're not doing that. One of the, one of the really, really valuable things that, that folks like Steve and, and Mike, and I've got the most experience with Mike doing this, uh, have, have done is, you know, we should be creating the stories ourselves. You know, as, 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 as worker, you know, workers organizing together, we should create the stories ourselves, and the media should be able to pick it up. But I, I definitely think that, that, that labor press, uh, there's, there's real credible journalism work that is cr trying to, to dig into and understand and break apart those stories and tell them in a way that makes sense and makes people understand what's going on and, and, and hold on to it. And, and I, I've got to, I, I don't compliment Mike very much, but I've got to compliment Mike I for... No, I, I, mean, I, go I, to don't, I, don't, I don't blame him. <laughs> I don't compliment him ever, uh, but I've got to you know, really compliment Mike, for, particularly for the work that he did around the, uh, around the Honeywell lockout and creating a narrative that, you know, even though we had uh, rock star activists like, like Stephen and John Paul and Christian, um, you know, that, that wouldn't have been the story, you know, the 230 folks in Metropolis, Illinois wouldn't have been a, wouldn't have been a story if it was about uh, pensions and uh, and whether they're going to cliff vest vacations, and I still have no idea what the hell cliff vesting is. And I worked on a campaign for for, uh, for twelve months. Um, you know, it, you know, if it was about the facts, then that 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 wasn't something that was going to get people excited. But but it, you know, it, it, you know, we created Mike created this narrative where there's this this very powerful, very connected C, uh, CEO. <coughs> Uh, that is running a very aggressive campaign to, to lock out these folks who work in very dangerous jobs um, and, and really created a David and Goliath story, uh, but also foreshadowed that, that, our, that our David could slay Goliath. Um, and, you know, the, uh, you know and it, as, as is the case in so many of our, of our campaigns, definitely uh, Goliath is not down on the ground uh, and dead, but as a result of that struggle and as a result of that fight, they did come up with outcomes that were much, much better than they otherwise would have um, and, and, and uh, really have a contract that they could be proud of as a result of, uh, as a result of that struggle. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here. Steve, I've been reading your stuff for, for a long time and uh, remember you coming to talk to my classes at Cornell. So it's, it's very exciting for me to, to, to be here. The campaign has been successful in getting national, national publicity and also getting the voices of fast food workers out. Uh, but you know, going back to the uh, Walmart campaign, because there were some protests in the Bay Area, San Leandro and um, uh, in Richmond, they did have uh, uh, 100, 200 people out picketing, uh, and a, a couple, several Walmart workers. But the workers that did go out, and now there's a campaign, went out by themselves and were fired. So now there's a campaign to get their jobs back. And the likelihood of them getting their jobs back is very small with Walmart. Uh, so what is the result of the workers who are left inside Walmart? Uh, they're going to be concerned that if they do such kind of action, they're going to be a camp, and they're not going to be in a, in a position to organize. So whether that was a good tactic or not. But the other interesting thing about the Walmart campaign, which is important, it hasn't really been covered by journalists, really, is that the UFCW, which has, I think, in the Bay Area, maybe 70, 80,000 members, didn't mobilize their members to go out and join them at Walmart. So here you have a union that has a Walmart campaign to organize Walmart, support the Walmart workers, and they themselves don't organize a rank and file to join their members who are out there picketing. So what does that say about getting your own members involved? And uh, I think it's the same with, uh, you know, a, a lot of unions. It, it seems like it's going to, it's getting the rank and file mobilized. And I want to go back to 
the ATU uh, thing in the SEIU 1021, because in the Bay Area, there are many ATU locals, not just a BART, there's a Salmonville, Sam Trans, there's Marin County, uh, there are a lot of ATU locals, and there's yet to be a rally of all ATU locals. And SEIU 1021 has 54,000 members, it has some workers without contracts, they haven't had a mobilization of their whole membership. So the question is, if you're facing a, a major battle in, in the Bay Area, the BART um, struggle is a major battle for public workers and transit workers, what are you going to do to mobilize your own members, first of all, and then reach out to the public? And the other thing is that I would add is there are, there are tens of thousands of workers in Northern California who are without contracts. CWA, the newspaper workers, here at the Chronicle. Uh, CWA, UPTI workers, you see there are thousands of workers at UPTI. None of these workers really are being brought together collectively so that it's not just about the bar workers, it's about all workers who's facing similar concession demand. So I, I think unless the unions and labor is going to focus on bringing all the working class together, so it's not just about the bar workers, it's not just about the, the UC workers, it's not just about the Hayward workers, it's about all of us. You've got a problem isolating the struggle so it, for the public it becomes, well this is just about bar workers. And we don't want it to become just about bar workers, it's more than bar workers. Yeah, I, you know, I, I always say it's the most interesting thing because people are always talking about how does the labor movement uh, organize new workers, you know, in this difficult area. But if, but if you look at it, a lot of unions just have a tough time mobilizing their own members or don't know how to do it or they're running these sort of top-down structures. I mean, we had a picket line in Missoula, which was just outside of a nursing home. It was a chain of nursing homes in the town, and there wasn't a single worker from that nursing home there. It was all kind of paid staff and activists, etc. Um, you know, we, we, we see that a fair amount uh, when you go to some of this stuff, um, which is, you know, is the cart before the horse. Now, I think this fast food workers campaign, uh, I have a lot of different feelings about. Um, and I, I, I could discuss, I guess, since what everybody else's feelings are about it. There's always this knock uh, within traditional organized labor, which is that the big crisis of organized labor comes from the need to get dues paying members in the doors because that's how you sustain the labor movement, right? And there's been a reluctancy on the behalf of some union leaders, of many union leaders, to organize people in the fast food retail industries, in particular because there's a lot of high turnover, folks are very desperate, they can be fired very quickly, stores can be closed, etc. Uh, it's one of the most difficult sectors to organize. Uh, so they're not often organized that much. Um, these kind of workers. And so the idea is, you know, okay, you might not get back a dues paying member. And so there's a reluctancy on one end. But I think there's a couple interesting things that come out of the Walmart campaign, and I mean the, the fast food workers campaign. And I, I have a lot of misgivings about it because I see that how it's being driven, and it's being driven from a very staff top down perspective. You know, it's SEIU. Obviously, SEIU has a tendency to use workers as pawns and not really put them in the driver's seat to have these tightly choreographed things. And obviously they're not pushing for NLRB elections, they're pushing for a car check agreement. And when they push for car check agreements, that often means cutting sweetheart deals with the boss. So th there are some misgivings there, knowing the history of SEIU. However, if we get back to the issue of whether or not it's financially sustainable to organize workers that are very difficult to organize, uh, let me ask you this, pose this question. How financially sustainable is it in reproducing members to give $400 million a year to the Democratic Party? Hmm. So, if you took a chunk of that money we were going to the Democratic Party and pumped it into low-wage worker stuff that you might not get members out of, is that a bad trade-off? Uh, I, I don't necessarily think so. And I think what's interesting about this fast food worker strike is nationally, the labor movement is trying to pull together uh, a coalition to pass a minimum wage increase. We see a couple states, we're in Minnesota, where they're trying to pass, what's it, 959? 950 by 2016. 2015. Oh. Yeah, the, yeah the, the House, the Minnesota State House has passed it. The Democratic controlled Senate hasn't passed it yet. Um, so there's a number of states uh, that are trying to do that. And so instead of doing what labor would typically do in a political action situation, which is give a lot of money to Democratic lobbyists and inside the Dunway <coughs> Hubsters to try to move the bill forward and hold some full rallies, they're actually uh, getting workers to create facts on the ground, to create a narrative about uh, fast food workers. Some workers, you know, very limited numbers going out on strike. 
and it's gotten a lot of media attention uh, all over the place. Uh, it's compelling. These are big name brand companies. It's often tough to get attention to labor struggles because you have a company like Rotec Ball Bearings out in Aurora, Ohio, and how do you tell the average worker? I mean, it's kind of interesting because they make stuff for windmills, so there's a clean energy, but you know, you go to some of these companies that you got to spend 20 minutes explaining to your readers what exactly it is that they make, and here are these big name brand companies that Americans don't like to begin with. So from a political action model, it's pretty interesting. Um, from the perspective of is money going to this kind of stuff versus giving to the Democratic Party, which probably isn't a debate they're having within the labor movement, but we're not sure of that. I think it's a much more effective use of money if, they're, if the goal is to build community support. Much better to create facts on the ground through organizing workers than trying to organize Democratic politicians. Uh, so I think that's one element of it. There's something else interesting about it. Um, which is the idea that workers during an organizing drive are going to go on unfair labor practice strikes before they have a non union setting. And the question that I have is, with the amount of media attention that the fast food worker strike is getting, is this going to inspire other workers and other workplaces, even outside of fast food, to start thinking differently about, about hey, we should organize, or maybe we should take the risk, we're not going to get fired, but these guys didn't get fired, or we might get fired, but it's worth it. Um, and we saw an interesting situation with um, a bunch of rail service workers outside of Chicago, in Chicagoland, who were being organized by the IWW. IWW. Um, and there were some illegal firings in the middle of the drive. And instead of the workers found charges with the board, waiting for the board to decide it, they went out on a week-long strike uh, to go against the boss. And the, you know, this helps create some leverage for unions when going through an organizing drive, which is that if you have 75% of support and you can have a, a nursing home or some other facility where folks are going to say, hey, we're going to go out on a day strike if anybody gets fired. And we saw this happen at Cablevision at CWA where there were two ac union ac activists that were fired and the workers went out on strike. But, you know, the, these real tech strike service workers outside of Chicago, they went out on strike. It helped them get through the drive. And ultimately, they wind up winning their election 1750. Now, they still got a big road to get a first contract, but I think that's an interesting thing, is that here was a group of workers making more money than, you know, they're making 14 bucks an hour, so obviously they're doing, it's not amazing, you know, it comes out to 24,000 a year, but they're doing better than most fast food workers. Uh, going out and um, on these, this kind of strike and being able to keep their union together, and ultimately win an election when faced with the kind of situation where people start running for the exits. So I think there's some interesting things that might come out of the fast food workers strike uh, that could parlay, you know, the, the, the political dialogue around changing the minimum wage, uh, whether other workers are going to go out on unfair labor practice strikes during organizing drives, create a little more leverage for the union to protect workers during an organizing drive. Uh, I think there's some interesting things that might lead to some conversation, some inspiration. Uh, but that's certainly the first kind of new idea I've heard, because there's always these big labor panels where you get Stephen Lerner, or you get Stu Aikoff, or you get Bill Fletcher, or Jay McLeavy, or one of these people that claim to be a messiah for the labor movement. And they come up with a big idea. But that was the first one I've heard in a long time, where, OK, let's go take a work of, group of workers organizing what's going on a strike. And I think that has an interesting dynamic. So the fast food worker strike is a little troubling because of, of, of the people leading it and whether or not rank and file workers are actually going to have a voice at the table. But I do think it has the potential to have a, a, a significantly larger impact than we realize. Maybe perhaps not directly in those chains, but if you look at the amount of media support it's getting, it's getting a lot more than any organizing drives that <coughs> have been successful. Um, and that's, that's interesting. Is that going to inspire other workers to do things? That, has in one instance, maybe it will in others, I don't know. Tact and they see somebody stand up and fight, they tend to want to fight more also. So uh, I know that it, it's happened a lot of places. Well, we went out on strike for four days, and the management of BART and the management of AC Transit are trying to keep the timeline separate. The contract expired June 30th for both. But there are different legal hoops that the two units have to jump through. So AT192 over at AC Transit has to defend the right to interest-based arbitration, um, which kind of held them up a little bit longer. 
But I think what their members what their members could see is that we went out on strike and they did, and they they throw some blame at the, the union leadership at that. Uh, but that encouraged a lot of folks to fight. Uh, when when you see the folks at the airport um, organizing, a lot of the concessions are at the airport. So I lump the two together sometimes. The fast food. Uh, when you see those folks uh, standing up to fight, especially when they potentially have more to lose, they might not be organized, or you're seeing the undocumented uh, workers stand up and organize, uh, fight back, um, especially if there are a number of different fights in the Bay Area. Then people are like, okay, they're seeing other people fight, we should go out and fight too. Um, covered a lot of topics here. So that, that, that's one thought. I think maybe bringing it, tying it together with what you were saying also is that um, Telling stories makes sense, but sometimes it's hard to tell a consolidated, simple, easy to digest story when it's a long, complex nuance. Try, try writing about chemical process safety. Right? How do you make that? How do you make <laughs> that a, really tough? How do you make that a <laughs> short, fun. digestible, or heartwarming story? And I think those are the two things: short and digestible, or you know, the human side. Because um, I, I think I would argue, and I think Lee might agree with this, is that on the left. There's a lot of labor reporting that's kind of like touchy-feely and inspiring. But the knowledge, the information that we have about these scab companies, you know, there used to be, I always hear Chris Townsend talk about this, you know, uh, rub sheets where you had information on who were the union busters, what companies did they operate with. Lee's done a lot of this work in terms of looking at lobby companies, PR companies. <coughs> we don't have enough knowledge of who we're fighting against about. And those aren't necessarily interesting stories, but when you do expose a company, when you do expose documents, especially some of these union busters like we did with Henry Winkler, this story on AFMAC, uh, which is one of these scab companies, it does create some interesting conversations, especially the rise of these wraparound all service provided, lockout contingency workforce providers. Um, and so the, the, there is a balance, and I do feel sometimes the, the left media in particular uh, tends to focus just on the stories, particularly. Um, the left media, and you know, I think my colleague Mr. Idelson on this one, uh, tend to do these kind of big picture, I have the grand idea that's going to save the labor movement. Uh, and as I know, it's, it's quite complicated. You're dealing with a lot of different workplaces, and I think if you look at every, what, what is the answer to saving the labor movement, I, I don't think there is one thing. I think we've got to think smarter, we've got to talk better, we've got to do everything we're doing better, and just work harder and think smarter. <coughs> Just about every little decision, and, and you know, the idea you never hear discussed is cutting out all the waste of the high executive salaries that some of these unions have. Um, so, 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 so there's there's a lot of stuff, um, but I think there's a tendency, sort of on the left, sometimes to just do stuff about low wage workers. Definitely don't cover workforces where there's a lot of white guys out in the middle of nowhere that are making 15 bucks an hour. That trying to deal well, with their union going well. Uh, if I can pick up on that, it's not a question of white guys, it's a question of you've got tens of millions of people in the workforce who are, uh, you know, technical and professional workers who are customer service reps, <coughs> who are, you know, doing manufacturing jobs, um, who are not the most oppressed, but have many of the same workplace problems. And I think the real long-term test of whether you can rebuild the labor movement on a broader basis uh, is going to be whether some of the backers of our Walmart or Fight for 15 are willing to do what uh, CWA has bravely done over 30 years with a succession of groups uh, starting with the High Tech Workers Network in Massachusetts in the 1980s and then Wash Tech up in Seattle which took on Microsoft on behalf of uh, uh, software people who were long-term temps greatly exploited um, by, by Microsoft and other high-tech companies in that area. The alliance at IBM, which is another attempt within a single uh, high-tech company to organize people without regard to potential bargaining units, of which there are none. Um, it's an organization, associate member style group, that has sustained itself for many years, welcoming a mix of white-collar, blue-collar workers, salaried, hourly, technical professional, um, we had a group called Wage at non-union GE plants that mainly drew on hourly manufacturing workers and CWA right now is supporting a group called TU 
which uh, has about 1,000 members out of a potentially organizable workforce of 35,000 at T-Mobile. Again, uh, largely in the south, which is supposedly an area of interest, but you know, these are workers who are making 35 to 40, sometimes 50,000 a year in uh, cell phone retail stores and call centers and as technicians. So, you know, they're, and they're not necessarily going to take the same sorts of risks that people will do, understandably, given their poverty and desperation and high turnover jobs and, you know, uh, warehouses and fast food joints and, and retail stores. And so the approach to building an organization, as Patrick pointed out, hopefully based on exercising Section 7 rights and getting people involved in collective activity and winning some victories to build a membership organization, very difficult, very labor intensive, uh, intensive, requires a lot of heavy union subsidies over many, many years, and a lot of uh, deep digging and nurturing of rank and file leaders because you can't sustain it with staff people and a traveling circus of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, strikes in every city, which is very impressive, very inspiring, and I hope it, you know, fans the flames, but it's a little different than the kind of long-term organization of, of uh, the militant minorities and minority unions that I think we need to do in more sectors if this is really going to have um, the impact that we need it to have. If we try to, I guess if we try to tie the, the survival of the labor movement with uh, labor journalism, I guess, so there's fewer and fewer labor journalists, you said the labor beat's shrinking, so the alternatives are trying to get our message in the mainstream media, or to try to get our members or workers to carry that message out there via whatever their social media, their communities, their networks. Um, and I think that might be more of what we're trying to do is get our members more educated on the issue so that they do reach their communities. But that kind of combines the two things. Rather than hiring, uh, just counting on paid staff and using the union's dues, money, and resources for that, um, the more that we can have rank and file newsletters or educating of the members about what the issues are, about other community struggles, the more they can articulate what's going on to their communities. I mean, that kind of boosts their consciousness about what's going on, um, but helps get the message spread out where there's an absence of labor journalism, where the media is not covering it. Yeah, I mean, one, one important aspect of this is you stream, streaming channels. And we've set up uh, here a thing, conference called Labor Tech, which trains workers and trainers how to use communication technology, social media. And at a previous conference of Labor Tech, uh, Stephen Letch and the workers from uh, Metropolis, Illinois, Honeywell came and they were able to set up a channel, a streaming channel. And, and think about this, every local in the country could have their own channel. Could have their press conferences, could have meetings, educational things. So I think that that was a good opportunity to see how can we use this new technology. It does cost a million dollars, doesn't require, you know, full-time staff and that kind of thing. And maybe you can talk about that soon. Pointing out to some of the organizers, I mentioned that <clears throat> during our labor dispute, which uh, ended up being 14 months long, our union president came to me and uh, at the beginning of the labor dispute and said, hey, we want to set up a website. The company's got one. We threw one together. Uh, it wasn't hugely successful, but it was getting some traffic. Somehow or another, Steve found us on the internet and contacted our union president and said, hey, send some guys here to Labor Tech. Uh, it's, a, it's a good fit for your struggle. So an, another union brother and I came out to San Francisco and uh, went from almost zero knowledge of how to do any of this stuff to, uh, you know, we returned home. We started live stream, streaming uh, community meetings with the regulator, regulatory agencies, which really, really got into their skin. Uh, in one meeting, we even took live questions from Facebook. Uh, so <clears throat> we, we did some groundbreaking things in a very rural area in Southern Illinois and we're able to involve a, a much larger audience to a, to a dispute that was very compartmentalized in a very rural area. What is, it was like 200 guys locked down with the Facebook page. Of like Do you want to say who we, you are? We have 30. Do you say who you are and what your struggle is? Oh, I'm, my name is Stephen Leck. I'm, I was, uh, I'm actually still in a struggle with Honeywell uh, International, particularly the uh, uranium plant in Metropolis, Illinois. Um, but through some of this online organizing that, uh, that, that Steve invited us down here we get to labor tech that we really honed we have like 3,500 followers on Facebook now um, because of the interest in our struggle and because the way we put it out and the last time I looked at our website I think we had something like 680,000 hits to our website um, 
we manage all this without a staff, with no full-time people in our union. It's done by rank-and-file members. Um, we just have a, a group of members that are uh, we sit down with for 15 to 30 minutes at a time and say, hey, I want to show you how to do this. You know, next time we'll sit down and we'll figure out how to do this. So we have all these people that know how to do it now. Um, very, very effective, and, and I'm grateful to Steve for somehow finding us in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and inviting us down. And then waking up internationally, so that was good. Yeah, um, it, it just grew and grew and grew from, from getting the word out there, it just continued to grow, and, and eventually uh, another union brother and I went to Germany and Belgium and talked to Honeywell workers there. So the, the struggle for the, at the time, we had about 220 the, workers. Give you some money for the store? Yeah, the, the, actually the German Works Council for Honeywell donated $1,000 for, for this tour even. Um, which this is, obviously it's not a Honeywell uh, tour, uh, but they are so interested in our struggle here that, uh, you know, they remain interested in throughout, throughout our fights with Honeywell. They've helped workers that have been terminated, they uh, to workers that have been laid off. And so the story kept growing, and it was based upon some of the online organizing that we were doing, and a lot of help from the international. Um, but I always felt like we got help from the international because we made ourselves a good investment. We were fighting the kind of fight that they thought was worth it to invest in. And when they saw that we were willing to fight, the resources came. Uh, you know, we got a lot of, uh, we, we got hooked up with talented people like Patrick. Uh, Patrick and I have been good friends. We, we got hooked up with Mike. I still can't remember how we got hooked up with Mike, but uh, but it happened, and uh, I, I wouldn't change anything. Mike has written what twenty something stories. Yeah, now I'm working on a book. Um, and it just kept us relevant. So, and that's you know that's how we made it through. You can't you know the worst thing that you fear in a, in a dispute like that is being forgotten about. And so we just did everything we could. We just wanted to, people to remember that we were still out. So. Dur during this tour, hey, wait, wait. Who's that speaking, Anthony? speaking of social media, how many of you would follow Steve Early if he was on Twitter? Steve got two. Three. I would. Three. Oh, Four. this is the making of a fellowship. <laughs> He's coming out with a book. I'm telling you. We'll, we'll argue about this at the bar later. I, think. I said we have a, a, re a proposal at the Chelsea <coughs> Convention for a labor channel. Uh, I agree with, uh, you know, Mike. If the AFL-CIO and the SEIU spent 5% of the money that they're spending on politicians on media, they could have a daily newspaper, they could have a national television channel, they could cover the campaigns every day, do regular education, documentaries, do a real education political campaign. And it's like fighting with one, one hand tied behind the back. The corporate media are not going to tell your story. They will have sound bites of this or that struggle, but they're not going to give in-depth analysis and your story. And the fact of the matter is labor, working people, and our unions can have a channel, can cover these stories in-depth. And I think that that's a political task that labor journalists need to fight for. I know in my union with CWA, we had a resolution to our national convention, which our, our local passed here, the media workers, to stream our convention to the members. And they said they didn't even respond to that. They told us they didn't even have Wi-Fi at the convention. So that was well, one the, problem. the communication workers of America did well, not have Wi-Fi at their convention. Yeah, yeah, that's not, yeah, the and they had a press section, so it was like they're... Time to I fire there, Candace. I was there. I was trying to write stories on what was happening and do other work, because it's a long convention and some of it's quite boring. Uh, but I couldn't. I had to leave the hall in order to get any work done. Well, well okay, I, here's what I'm going to suggest. That's not, that, that's not the half of it. Next Friday night, the president of CWA is going to be a few blocks away. You know, it was a problem at the convention. I thought, well, you know, they have these big screens at national conventions, if anybody went to a national convention. Well, the screen at the, at the CWA convention, all it said was CWA. It didn't have any of the speakers. So you have a bizarre situation in which the president, Larry, is trying to look out at the delegates and trying to look at the delegates that are at the uh, podium to speak. You couldn't see them because they didn't have television cameras at the convention to have their members up there. And the television workers from Detroit, I know why interviewed, were furious because they represent television workers who are at the convention to do this kind of work. So the question is, if, if a CWA communication workers, which represents media workers,
workers, TV workers, themselves don't even cover their own convention. There was a debate there on immigration. There was a debate there on, on how, how to fight the telecom companies. This was important discussion and debate which would have enlivened the membership. There's debate, discussion, uh, but I think there's a fear, there is a fear, of having these kind of debates and discussions to the members. To, to, well, to I want to challenge that a little bit. Wait, 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 can I have one thing on this? Wait, uh, AFSCME last year had its first contested election in 30 years. Uh, you had two candidates who were running against each other in the Secretary Treasurer's race a few years before, and I think out of like 1.4 million members, uh, Lee Sonnen. And I remember the, the AFSCME communications director said, well, you're the first person to ask me about this. And it's like, well, you know, you have this big, huge conference and nobody can watch. And, and, and the thing is, I was trying to report on it from afar. We didn't have the resources to send someone out there, and I was even watching on Twitter, and I would hear like tidbits of what was happening on the floor during what seemed like some contested rules motions, but there was no way for me to tell what was going on because there was no connection right from the hall. Well, we did we did live stream our convention uh, two <coughs> rounds ago, um, and we didn't live stream our our most recent convention because there were a, a total of 120 unique viewers. Uh, when we live streamed our, our convention two rounds ago. Just nobody watched it at, at, at all. Um, what we did with the last convention was we did like five minute daily recaps of kind of what had gone on. Um, and yeah, it's filtered through union bureaucracy and it's you know, filtered through the, the lens of the, of the National Union. But our viewer, you know, we, we had about 2,000 people watch each one of those uh, daily recaps. So, you know, the, the, you know, the yeah, that's, that's a question of uh, large-scale information versus uh, digestible information that, that, that can be useful, uh, useful to workers. And, you know, well, really, I mean, probably the best thing to do would be live stream it and then pull out a, you know, an outtake. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that you know, we, we live, that there is a lot of live streaming that, that goes on. It, it became very, very democratized and, and popular during the Occupy movement, where every committee meeting got live streamed. Um, it's not a really great way to consume information uh, for, for, for a lot of folks. So, I, I but but it's so cheap. I mean, if you look at the Occupy stuff, free at all. Uh, with the idea of the bureaucracy really deciding what the workers should see in the members of the union. I don't believe in that. The so workers, the workers, so the workers, so it's so not a question of money. The workers pay for these conventions through their dues. They have a right to see, in my view, what's being said there. And the fact that you can't even have your own speakers, not just debate, but just the, your speakers. This is, you know, your setup, not debate, not discussion, just speakers you're presenting at the convention. You can't even see those. I mean, that's a problem. That's a problem. I, yeah, I, I, think, I don't see. I don't think there's any. I, 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 I don't mean, get the indignation because only 120 people. Only 120 no, I, no, I, it's, it's a principle. It's a principle. I think it's a principle of the matter that workers should see their own convention. Kosato streams their convention. I don't say why not. Why shouldn't workers be able to well, see no, their no, convention? No, no, no. You, you can have 120 people watch, but who who are those 120 people? Is that two or three reporters that don't have the access to go to a convention that have to write up the convention? Is that? You know, is this a, is this somebody watching a closely contested district director's race who's interested in what's happening on the floor? Uh, you know, I it, I don't think the number matters. I mean, especially if you look at how cheap some of this live streaming is. You could hook up something like that to the internet and get a stream and pay. You know, what ten bucks maybe? Maybe that's right. Well, no, no, I, I, I think. Look, wait. I mean, I don't think there's any disagreement here that the <laughs> latest technology should be made available in any union. So that any union member can end up being board stiff following their international union's convention, however frequently or more likely infrequently it meets. The, the, my concern, having been to a CWA convention uh, several years ago, where a friend of mine was running for international union office, the first time that a local union officer had challenged a kind of quasi-incumbent for a top headquarters position, was that the rules of the convention didn't even permit opportunity for much discussion or information sharing, much less the debate between the candidates among the 1,500 people who were the delegates there in person and being asked to vote on these choices. So, I mean, there's levels of complexity here. How you democratize the process, I think everybody would support or should support Steve's initiative, but certainly within CWA, if we're staying on that uh, problem for a moment, 
another challenge is how do you make the convention itself for the people who are there delegated by their locals to vote on important questions how do you ensure that the agenda permits debate and discussion of those issues and, and, that's and worth the, the, recording? And that's, that's, that for me is the big, is, yeah. is the big question. Because and that's a challenge were big right opposition. there. And when we had big opposition caucuses like this Alaska yeah. campaign and stuff right. like that, there was enough resistance you know, even for, you know, from the from the stage to 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 force debate where it, you know where it didn't, didn't happen. Well, and, and or in the AFSCME situation, the the executive board was split, so the factions negotiated special rules, which created several hours worth of face-to-face -face well, candidate okay. debates, very rare in most unions, and an opportunity for delegates to question the candidates before they voted. So I mean, that is a way of enlivening. Yeah. Our labor movement. Let's have a debate. I mean, actually, and then you debates, have content the debates at the, C the, the, the debates at the CWR convention were very interesting. They, they were. were. They, they were all, intentionally they had a whole debate of in immigration, uh, security of the borders, what's happening with the borders, the question of the telecom companies pitting one local against another. Yeah. Those were good debates. I mean, those were yeah. important debates that the members were concerned about. It's their jobs. What's going on with them? So, but the 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 thing is, it's something separate from the actual things going on in the locals. Those debates are not taking place. And that would change the dynamic in the unions, in the rank and file, if there were debates that are going on were throughout the union and everybody was involved in them. Then you have an enlivened union that's, that's fully engaged. And I think that's the problem. A lot of workers are not engaged in their union. Getting workers to go to union meeting is very difficult in, in most cases. Very few people show up, so we have to find means to get our own members involved so they're part of a debate and discussion. If we can do that, it'll be a different labor movement.